Hi writers, in this video I'm going to go over the methods and results sections of the NRAD, specifically giving a few tips for success and pitfalls that you should avoid to make sure you are hitting all the requirements of this genre. Uh, first, I'll just review generally what the methods, results, and discussion sections do and how they differ from each other. And then I'll talk through two of the rhetorical choices that students often struggle with, uh, verb tense and point of view switching. And then lastly, I'll go over how you have to describe everything and give some tips for how you can do that, specifically in your methods and results sections. So first, just a few reminders about the different sections. The method section, uh, remember, is where you are describing your research instruments, your sampling method, your coding system, and how you analyze the data. The goal here is to describe everything um, with detail so that a researcher could replicate your study just from reading your method section. After that, the results section is where you are trying to recount your data as objectively as possible. This is where you might include graphs or charts to help visualize your data. And the discussion section is where you are interpreting your data. So this is where you get to explain what it all means and how it connects to your research questions. The first area where a lot of students struggle rhetorically is verb tense. Um, so specifically in the methods and results sections, you want to use the past tense to, sh to show that your research took place in the past. So remember, the research that we're doing um, is going to be done by the time somebody is reading your paper in the future. And so that's why researchers tend to use past tense. But also it shows readers that the research that you did, the data that you collected, is only true for these points in the past. So for example, um, this is from a student's paper. They might say, or they did say, for this study, I would like to do a mixed methods. Well, actually, you conducted it, right? It's already done. Um, and so a lot of times this happens because students have taken stuff from their research proposal and they put it into their MRAD, which is great. You just have to go back through and make the appropriate revisions to make them past tense. So anytime you're talking about future things for your methods or your results, change it to past. Now, of course, there are times in your paper where you are going to use present tense or where you're going to use future tense. Those might pop up in your introduction or in your discussion section, and that is totally expected. You just have to think about it rhetorically. What is verb tense telling the reader about what you're trying to say? Another rhetorical aspect that students often struggle with is this idea of point of view or POV. Um, if you think back to, you know, writing classes that you've taken in the past, you may have heard about first person, second person, third person. With academic papers like this, you'll generally see first person or third person. Um, second person is not going to pop up because there's no real reason to address the reader directly. Um, first person is when you're using I or me, right? And this is becoming more and more common in academic research. It used to be that you only used third person or passive voice, but nowadays it's totally um, all right to use I as long as you're using it appropriately. So in these cases, in this first excerpt here, the student has, I believe, anyone who owns a car. Fine, right? They're using first person. But later in the paper, they say the researcher. So whatever you want to do, you need to stay consistent. In this case, the student is using first person when they say I believe, and they're using third person when they say the researcher. My recommendation, take out I believe and stick with third person, right? Sometimes it can also make your writing sound stronger if you take out phrasing like I believe, because you're the one writing the paper, so we can assume that what you're writing is what you believe. So in this case, it's stronger to say and anyone who owns or wants to own, blah, 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 blah. The use of passive voice is um, a little controversial among uh, writing teachers. I'm sure you've had teachers who have said, don't use passive voice. Um, but actually, in academic writing, and specifically when you're writing MRADs, you will come across a lot of passive voice because it can make your methods or results seem to exist independently of you or the researcher. It can give some distance. Um, between the writer and the work that is being reported. Um, as a reminder, passive voice is where you put the object at the forefront of the sentence. So for example, if I say the researcher conducted 
This is active voice. The researcher is doing the work and conducted is an active verb. Passive voice, on the other hand, is where we forefront the object. So here we would say the remaining interview, the object, was conducted through email. This shows that the actor is, we don't know who the actor is. We don't need to know. It's not important. What's important is that the interview was conducted through email, not that the researcher conducted interviews through email. Both meanings are the same, passive or active voice. You're just choosing to highlight the object as opposed to the subject, the researcher. Again, the student used were provided, um, were asked, and so they started with active voice, introducing the researcher, and then switched to passive voice, maybe also to give some variety in the writing. But just be aware of when you're using passive or active voice, and are you doing it intentionally? The last area where students tend to struggle in the MRAD uh, methods and results sections is describing everything. We've talked about this a bit with your methods, how I want you to describe everything that you did. Um, we're going to dive even a little bit more into it because now that you've completed your methods, um, you will have a little bit more to add. So remember, your methods section should be tedious to read. Another researcher should be able to replicate your study by reading your methods. For example, uh, this student wrote, uh, this study is a series of quantitative interviews with professionals. I think they meant qualitative interviews, but it's fine. Um, that's actually not detailed enough. I would recommend describing how the interviews were actually conducted and the time span. So you could say instead, the study is a series of qualitative interviews conducted via Zoom over the course of two weeks. That is much more detailed. That's the level of detail I want you to get into in your method section. Your results section, uh, sadly, will be even more tedious to read. And this is because you're going to have all your descriptive statistics in there, figures, graphs, um, all of that. So you want to remember to label all your figures and be sure that if there's a result or a finding that you want to discuss ultimately in your discussion, you must report it in your results. So anything that you wanna talk about or connect to and try to use to answer your research question in your discussion must be reported on in your results section. We looked at a few examples of results in class. Here is another example. Um, again, it's quite tedious. Most participants, 62%, reported overall satisfaction with their residential experience. And then we've got our descriptive stats. So I do expect to see percentages in your results section for quantitative data, and I do expect to see uh, descriptive statistics for at least some of your quantitative data where it makes sense. The last thing about reporting everything is to make sure you label your figures correctly. So most of you will probably want to include some type of graph, chart, um, maybe even images or screenshots if you're looking at social media. Whatever you choose to include that is not part of the written text, it needs to be labeled. So in this case, we have a title for the graph, figure one. There is a short name of the graph. The graph is labeled on all axes. Um, if there are any abbreviations that need to be explained, make sure you make a note of that for your reader. And if you're talking about it in your paragraph, which you should be, you need to also refer to the figure in the text as well. We'll talk more about this as we revise and in group conferences, but I just want to highlight that this is something that a lot of students forget, um, so don't be one of them. I can't say this enough, but one of the best ways to learn how to write this type of writing is to look at lots and lots of examples. So I highly recommend going back to all of the examples that I've posted and see how they reported their results, how they wrote up their methods. Um, if we just want to pick one, uh, I'll pick this one here. It's a great example of different ways to write up your results. So. Um, yeah, just another plug for looking at what other people have done. This is not a creative genre. This is not something where you have a lot of freedom to play around. Um, so don't be afraid to follow what other people have done before because that is the genre. So up next, I'm going to record a short video talking about the MRAD discussion section uh, where I'll talk about how you actually interpret your data and draw conclusions in an ethical way.